some people who influence the world, at least the economic part of the world, are big corporations, uh, are corporations uh, whose leaders often convene in February in Davos, uh, and we all associate Davos with the WEF, the World Economic Forum. What we don't know about the WEF is um, that they actually will sort of work in between these uh, big meetings, uh, and Christiana knows uh, very much uh, what they do. Uh, they have sort of, um, uh, let's say, special councils uh, sitting together discussing about how to change, for example, education. Christiana, can you, can you cha um, share a couple of the issues that are being discussed and why it is important uh, to the corporate world yeah. uh, to concentrate on education? So thank you for having me and thank you for all of uh, you for being here and listening to us, but I'm very much looking forward to listening to you too uh, and see what you think about what we are discussing here when we open up for debate. Um, I had the World Economic Forum uh, was created um, almost 45 years ago by someone who has a title of professor, said Professor Schwab. So I think we have the DNA of being a learning space since the beginning, but it is true that we do not publicize it as such. Um, it started as a workshop, and actually it was a workshop to bring a diversity of voices around the table and um, help the business community at first, and then uh, grow to include many other groups on how others were thinking. So I think the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum is on the right path, because if you look at this panel, we all have a different hat and very different opinion or way of looking at the problem, and it was daunting to come and talk after <laughs> such a passionate um, human being, because we tend to be more of conveners, so passion come across what we do, but in a different way, and really chapeau to your experience and what you have done. But it's good to have this diversity when we discuss education, because most probably in today's interconnected world where the problems, especially the problem related to um, inclusive, social, economic, and uh, environmental friendly development have um, to be looked at from many different perspectives. We can't only look at this problem from a business point of view or a mm -hmm. social point of view or an environmental. So I think what the forum um, has been trying to do based on this uh, theory of the multi-stakeholder approach was really bringing these different voices around the table and try and find um, a common understanding first, which is what also Professor Pug was talking about, the understanding, and then try and identify a solution which um, are actually increasing the pie for everyone and not only one side or, or getting us to the next level. Um, uh, we have a Global Agenda Council on Education, it's true, and they look at education from more a more traditional point of view or where the systemic transformation of the educational system uh, should take place and is taking place and is either through technology or through a, a new developed set of values. So today collaboration, trust is more important than in the past. We, we have a global fellowship program, believe it or not, we are considered university in Switzerland and we train um, the next generation of leaders so that they can tackle the, prog the problem in this uh, um, interconnected way and with a mindset that is open. Um, and they're also doers, so um, I applaud the, the initiative of the German government because it goes in that direction where she talked about informal and formal education, childhood and training, but also adult and uh, leadership um, education. We have a council uh, made of uh, global university leaders, and these are the head of the major academic institution, the president of the major academic institution, and they help us understand how we can um, accompany and be partner in transformation of the leader that transit through our organization. And I think this uh, concept of transformation is particularly important when we look at education and sustainable education and education in sustainable development. Because from a transmissive system, a system that transmit information, so is informative, we need to shift into a transformative and instructive system, which means um, from a top-down uh, type of uh, um, pass the data or the piece of academic knowledge, we have to go into um, transform 
uh, who we are, uh, embrace the change and um, at the same time trying to be more instructive. So get information to act upon them rather than just um, have information for information's sake. And I think what is more and more important, that's why I go back to uh, the audience here, is the peer-to-peer -peer exchange. I think um, one learn more when exchange with others and one learn more when try to teach to others, others teach to you. Um, and, and, and so it's more of an horizontal process that I would encourage even here. So I would like to get out of this room where all of us have learned one little bit that help us understanding better how we can contribute to this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there's, I think, a yes, please. <laughs> and I think there is a reason why we actually get together physically uh, from time to time rather than uh, sort of uh, you sitting in New York, you sitting in South Africa, and we could all be there on a screen. But I think uh, that is uh, the real aspect of exchange. Um, Jürgen Bors, um, of course, traditionally, the book was uh, the means for the last couple of centuries uh, by which we could acquire knowledge. Um, and your industry has, is undergoing a, a transformative uh, uh, situation right at the moment as well. You yourself have actually said that um, the MDGs are very important um, that, and the fact that poverty could be avoided is actually quite shocking because so few consequences have been drawn from that. But you said that your industry is actually picking up the challenge. How? One always has to see that the book is something special. We're not selling cars or refrigerators or anything else. But the book is about freedom of speech and exchanging ideas. So we always fight for that as an organization, as a commercial organization on the one hand, but also as an organization which is tasked to fight for this freedom of speech but being able to speak up about what's happening in the world, I think it needs literacy. And, and that's what we are fighting for. Since uh, I think alone in Germany, there are about four million people which are functional illiterate. Yeah? And you think this is a, one of the richest economies in the world. And still four million people out of maybe 90 million people mm -hmm. cannot read. How do they have access to education? How do they have access to actually exchanging ideas with others. So this is for us very, very important. And now we've done a lot of things. We have, as you have, fellowship programs to bring people to Frankfurt. We have an institution called um, a literacy, a Lit Prom to promote literacy, to bring people together from foreign countries. They come to Germany, they exchange ideas, what we can do together actually to fight literacy. And so there are so many, many different ideas, especially coming from uh, uh, countries where they're really facing this problem even more than we are facing it here. Uh, we have other activities where we try to subsidize translations, especially from very small countries. It's called Litprom, liter literary promotion. And we try to bring these people, we have about 200,000 book professionals every year in Frankfurt. Yeah? And when we talk about books and publishing, we mostly think of, of Harry Potter but the largest sector of our industry is actually educational literature. Yeah? And this is where people are really, um, where we're seeing the change the most. And the paper is going away, we have all these electronic media, mm -hmm. and for some time I really did believe that this electronic media, access to electronic media, would really help education. But still, again, we first have to work on the literacy ground. And what you've been, all of you have been saying first, we have to reach the people first before technology really can step in and make access to uh, education easier. But first we have to reach the people, we have to reach them by bringing them to places like this to exchange ideas what we can do together. Mm -hmm. um, does it matter whether it's um, the means of the transformation um, of ideas? Does it matter whether it's a book or an electronic um, application or, or, or? No, it, it doesn't make any difference, actually. It's a story which is told, which is important. Mm -hmm. And I don't care which, whether I hear this story told from a Maori in New Zealand. Who only, they only started writing like 20, 30 years ago. They didn't have a written language. Or whether I read this on an e-book, on Kindle or whatever. It's the people behind the story. I need to know and I need to meet and I need to see why they have been forced to write this. Mm -hmm. yeah, what was their intention? 
Thank you so much. So we have uh, laid the ground now, uh, you know which uh, side everybody is coming from, and Jana has already had some responses. Yes, the Twitter community is following the panel discussion very closely and already sending their remarks and questions. And I think one of the main things is that they agree that education is key for sustainable development, but they really want to have concrete answers. How? What do we have to do? What has to be done? What, what does every individual can do? And um, they definitely love Mr. Goldberg, that he's bringing grassroots back, <laughs> to quote one of the Twitter. Um, and I have a question for Ursula Müller. She said that Germany is the second biggest spender in education worldwide. So someone wants to know, who's the biggest one then? Would you know by any chance? I mean, I hazard a guess. Uh, it might actually be the EU, uh, seeing that the EU is uh, the biggest donor worldwide. Well, I checked the ODA statistics in 2010. And Germany has also contributed to the EU Development Corporation uh, almost 20%. So I don't know uh, who is the f no, top number. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. We'll, um, we'll, we'll publish that uh, afterwards. Uh, and uh, if not, somebody can actually write an email to us and we'll find out. Um, let's, let's do just a quick round. I mean, I've had um, the agreement and disagreement on that side. Um, you, you, you beg to disagree, the two of you. Let me just kick off uh, with Professor Pog again and uh, sort of let's have a look at numbers just for a sec. Uh, we, we kicked off the conference uh, on Monday morning saying, well, actually with MDG2, we're not too bad. We are um, almost um, uh, around 82, 83% um, of uh, schooling of primary schooling uh, in the globe, and of course, uh, by 2015, we want to have 100%. Um, I know that you're always very critical about uh, numbers, um, and, and we also know that numbers can be sort of changed. Um, is that a fact that you agree with, and is that enough? Are we already on the right path? With regard to that statistic, I think we are on the right path, but you also write that I'm always very critical about statistics, and uh, Bismarck famously said, a former German chancellor, you know, you don't want to know how laws are made, and you don't want to know how sausages are made. Because, <laughs> and that uh, applies to statistics. Yeah, <laughs> and so I think you don't want to know how the MDG statistics are made. If you look, it is an ugly story, it really is. So here, with regard to education, uh, it's a binary count. You count how many people get educated up to a certain grade. And of course, the question, the real question is, what do these people have? What sort of education is that, right? You go to India and you find that a lot of people, a lot of teachers in India don't teach. So they mind the students for the time in the classroom. And then if anybody wants to learn something, why then you have to pay the teacher to stay longer and you get education afterwards and of course many children cannot actually do that that's quite common in india you know lots of people have told me that when i was traveling there so what matters is not so much whether the person is in school or is not in school that's important but not really uh, indicative of how much education people really receive but what matters is whether they actually learn mm -hmm. and that is something that the mdg does not in fact inquire into and you have uh, made a strong connection between MDG1 and MDG2, i.e. if somebody is starving or undernourished, uh, he or she will not have the cap capability to learn and to acquire knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I just want to get back to the two of you over there, um, because um, you strongly said, uh, Dennis, that we have to sort of rethink uh, the way that we learn, and that, of course, learning can only be interpersonal um, uh, in the end. Um, but would you agree uh, with uh, both Christina and um, with Jürgen that you need a certain amount of literacy in order to sort of partake in the societies that we have created? Absolutely. I, I've got no problem with the idea of literacy and numeracy. They're essential. Mm -hmm. uh, they're essential to understand the fact that figures can't lie, but liars can figure, as they say. <laughs> How's the sausage made? Um, absolutely necessary. You know, there's a tendency now, and I'm part of that tendency, to want to use the web, the internet, to transmit information to people who don't have books, where there are no libraries. And so uh, I also do the opposite thing. 
I have a little organization in Britain supported by its twin in Germany, Community Heart, which has shipped nearly three million books for children to South Africa. Because of the 30,000 schools, 20,000 had no libraries. And the language of education is English. Well, how do you learn without books? Without a little picture book, cat, dog, moo, <laughs> etc. you see. Uh, this is what I've done, because I say you can have a vision, but you've got to do. But more than that, you see, the problem with uh, automated learning, learning programs, is that for this very bright uh, part of every age cohort, they will learn whatever happens. But there are others who actually need motivation. And the, the, the motivation comes from a community that believes that education for children is important. It comes from committed teachers who are able to um, pass on their passion for learning. You see, you talked about you spread information to people who've never learned how to analyze information. And that's the fundamental need for this formal thinking. Mm -hmm. In my country, South Africa, we had a, a separate form of education for black South Africans called Bantu education, which was totally rote learning. There was a handbook, the teacher learned it, the teacher had maybe eight, 10 or 12 years in school and was a teacher. And all the children had to learn the handbook and spew it out and they would pass their exam. They were literate, they had a certificate, and now we say, we need young people who can analyze. Here's a question, answer it critically, make a critical, what does it mean? How do, out of such an education with such teachers? Mm -hmm. So how do we have a democratic education system? Very mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. No country in the world has so far had an equal education system. There are always people who don't get the help, uh, I could talk about Germany, certainly South Africa, America, and elsewhere. And we've got a lot of work to do to transmit the values of the humanity that our social democratic belief leads us to. We're all social democrats, except that some of us aren't social. <laughs> and many are not democrats. And the big corporations certainly are not. They have corporate social investment committees, because that's the thing to do to satisfy the criticism. But you pointed out, Professor, that since the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, in effect, poverty has grown as monopoly capital, called globalization, has become ever more dominant. More and more people are poor, more and more people die mm -hmm. in a world that could feed everybody. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean by charity. I mean by people able to grow their own crops to have markets, to exchange, and to grow. Those are the points that I think we need to talk about honestly. A globalized world, what do we in Europe, because I visit Europe so often, what do we in Europe know about Africa? Poverty, helplessness, not the tradition that African soldiers freed Europe from the Nazis. Shock, eh? but that's true. What do we know about the contribution, say, of the Mali Federation? Which, it's not part of our knowledge. We need to know. We need to know that we are the cradle of civilization, and you destroyed us. So these are things that are important for human understanding. Mm -hmm. But it does need formal education, of course. Absolutely, and the fact to think about it critically. Yes. Jürgen wanted to uh, yeah, add. I wanted, I wanted to comment on that but because you, you mentioned motivation, and I think it's all about motivation. You have to motivate teachers to teach properly, yeah, to get into interaction, not to ask money on top of it, as you said in India, this example. But you also have to motivate the young people to get interested in education, yeah, and it means before we can teach them reading, they need to be interested in reading. And this is very simple. I wanted to mention, because somebody asked in here, how can you do little steps? One little step, step we took as a book fair is to create an activity called, uh, in English, Soccer Meets Culture, where young kids are allowed to play with a top league player soccer, yeah, like once a week, twice a week, and they get a formal training. 
but after that they get um, they get trained in in getting fun in reading. So we combined the soccer mm -hmm. yeah, with getting fun in reading, and so this was an initiative which became very very successful. The how to, sorry, Christiana and then uh, Osla. Just the, the concept of global literacy, which is what you're talking about, it's very important today because we talk about global citizenship and if we look at the shift in demographic and powers, we see that maybe Western Europe and the US is not exactly the cradle of humanity anymore. Uh, and so maybe global literacy is key. How you go about it is a little bit more complex because each culture has a different way. And even in South Africa where you were saying you, you make very good progress actually in literacy, mm? literacy itself, afterwards the depth uh, of that literacy is in question because I was discussing with a publisher in South Africa of newspaper and he told me that as, even if more people can read, actually they can only read a small amount of text with a picture. So this is, this is for the media here. It's, okay, if that's the level of literacy, um, and I have a business model that requires me to sell, uh, copy and other things, because the business world is not bad, that allows us all to live and eat. Um, how do I do it? How do I compromise or negotiate between the need to communicate through a medium that my audience can understand, and the need to help them understand a context that is more complex than the tool they've been provided with by the formal education system? Mm -hmm. uh, big question, and it's a big responsibility on every part of civil society or the business or government and of the media, I think. So when the question was, what can we all do? First of all, um, the little steps are about understanding what's our role and what we can do in our little um, workplace or uh, family, etc. I mean, I always go back to, in, to the individual when, I, when it's about walking the first little step. Thank you. Um, Ursula, little steps and how to, in addition to what you wanted to add to Dennis. Yeah. I would also like to share a practical uh, example of uh, how to, uh, in, that Germany initiated a global education for sustainable development program between different countries. Um, we brought together experts and practitioners from India, from Mexico, South Africa, and Germany. And um, in this international dialogue, uh, we also address the specific needs of the various countries. So they have diff their own experiences and they can share best practices. And the program offers capacity development. And I think this is a key factor, the local capacities, um, for instance, for teacher training. This program in includes teacher training and um, also a leadership training program for young professionals um, because they can be a multiplicator. And there are some relevant factors for uh, the success of such a program. It's local ownership. Um, we always talk what we do, but it's local ownership that's, um, that involves partners, peoples, and then the different levels of the societies um, who should take part. It's uh, decision makers, it's um, NGOs, um, the civil society, education institutions, and local teaching staff. So um, I just wanted to mention this uh, because it's so important that capacity is built um, and local partner institutions are strengthened. Um, so this program that connects experts and uh, professionals of the five countries um, is a great success um, and it's uh, in various areas. Um, and I don't believe that Africa, um, the picture you painted about Africa, I spent uh, many years of my life also working in Africa. We in the Ministry of Development Cooperation and of Economic Cooperation and Development strongly believe that Africa is a continent of large opportunities. Mm. Um, notwithstanding, Africa has a very important role and I think uh, this particular forum uh, has a particular view uh, on Africa and doesn't share the sort of uh, usual picture that is being portrayed. Um, before I ask Mr. Pogo the next question, I would like to uh, make you aware of the fact that I meant what I said by getting involved in dialogue, so please get ready to put your questions to the panel. Um, and um, uh, whilst you do that, and whilst you think about what you want to ask, um, there are two issues that I still want to discuss here, which is one, e-learning. Whilst you may say um, it's sort of uh, books that we need, um, there is a role to the future both in the so-called developed and so-called developed 
developing world, and sometimes even it could be a step for the future. But um, Mr. Poga, I always need you as sort of the eagle's view. Um, we have, or we are, we're living in the middle of the United Nations Decade of Education for Sustainable Development. <sighs> long title, long word, uh, big effort, um, two years to go. An effort that was worthwhile, did it have any effect? Or is it sometimes like the facts and figures that you analyze with the MDGs? Yeah, I don't think it had a great deal of effect. I think more or less the same things would have happened that uh, happened with the decade would have happened even without it. Uh, the one thing that I want to emphasize uh, that in complement to what the previous speakers have said is that it's not just a matter of uh, education, yes or no, or how much education. It's also very important to think about what people learn. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, I said that in my opening remarks about the commercialization of education, increasingly the information that people get is very deeply biased information. So you have, for example, WIPO, the UN organization uh, that guards intellectual property rights, training judges in India. Well, what training is that exactly? Well, it's the importance of intellectual property rights. It looks unjust when new medicines that come onto the market in India are priced at a very high price so that poor people can't get them. But a little education maybe helps you over the shock. It teaches you that it's very important that there be strong incentives for corporations to do new research into new medicines. And so people get in a, you know, inured to this idea that intellectual property rights are good for humanity, good for the future. So I happen to believe that this is hogwash, that we can incentivize pharmaceutical innovation in a way that does not lead to high prices for medicines, that does not exclude the poor people during the initial 10, 15 years of the patent period. And so here again, education is needed in order to combat often the wrong and misleading information and education that is orchestrated uh, often by the rich countries in behest of their corporations, banks, industry associations, and so on. Which would lead us to the Global Impact Fund that you talk about, and maybe at the end of the discussion we still have uh, some time. Ladies and gentlemen, you know that there are the microphones uh, in the first couple of rows at your table. Unfortunately, I need your hand up in order to sort of uh, call you up, and there are also some microphones, as you might have seen uh, during the last two days, where you can actually walk to in the middle. You, you see the microphones? Just get up and move. Yes, well done. Walk towards the microphone and press the button. Great. 